two events capture the whole world's attention. Fewer still hold it in the era of mass media. In the Middle East, men who have ruled for decades, gone in days. From regional superpowers to wealthy Gulf states, all have felt the impact of the death of a penniless fruit seller in a small provincial town in the heart of North Africa's smallest country. Ultimately, Tunisia reflects a universal truth. One person who is not afraid to die can start a revolution, but it is only when hundreds and then thousands have lost their fear that a revolution becomes inevitable. The world is still trying to understand exactly what the revolution here in Tunisia really represents. For the West, this was a liberal movement that achieved for the Arab world its own Ceausescu moment, the getting rid of a hated dictator and his family. For people in the region, this is proof positive that ordinary people can overthrow a regime. For Tunisians, the reality is far more complex. Internet, Facebook, Twitter, they were logistic support. They were not the revolution. This regime was like, it's like a cancer. In the truth, we, the people of Tunisia, did not have to listen to the process. I saw people dying. I saw a guy shot straight in his heart. They say their pride d'avoir vu notre peuple, notre jeunesse, les mains nues, affronter la dictature et mettre à terre le dictateur. Il y a un chahé de mètre, mètre à l'arc, il faut dire à la chave, il faut dire à la tournée. If there is one lesson for autocratic rulers across the world, it is not to ignore your subjects however insignificant they might seem. There is a tragic symmetry to the story of this revolution. The most powerful man in the country brought down by one of the most powerless. Allah is Muhammad, a human being. A human being is a human being. He is a good man, 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 he is a good man. Mohamed Bouazizi started selling fruit at the age of 10 to support his family, later giving up his own education to send his sisters to school and then university. Mohamed Bouazizi was not the first young man to take his life in the country's impoverished and forgotten south. But the way he was treated by the local authorities on the 17th of December had a resonance for all Tunisians. أنا الصباح نهار الجمعة الصباح مشيت نسعى نخدم معناها في الفلاح البرة وطلعت على البيت متعه هو خلي نلقيه ريقد نوم عميق قلت والله يعاونك يا محمد وليد يقوم الصباح كما سيور ليام كما الليام كل ليام يمشي هز الشريول يعبي الخضرة من المرشي سنترات ويمشي معناها يمشي يقص على الكيس الرئيسي معناها راه ما هوش راه تاجر متجول. محمد had applied to the town hall for a license to allow him to set up a permanent store. When this went unanswered, he applied directly to the presidential office. There was again no reply. Instead, the regime took the little he had. On Friday, the 17th of December, Mohammed was stopped by a municipal officer and her three colleagues. She confiscated his fruit 
and the scales he borrowed from a friend. According to his sister, she insulted his dead father and ridiculed his lowly job and appearance before delivering a blow which was to echo around the world. He wants to kill him, he doesn't want to kill him, he doesn't want to kill him. He doesn't want to kill him, Muhammad came to him in shock. Muhammad came to him in shock, a strong, 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 معناها مرأة أمام الخاص والعام في كيس رئيسي. People in Sidi Bouzid were used to the demands of the police and local authorities, the traditional rashwa or bribe, without which nothing and no one can operate. But Muhammad had no money to buy back the confiscated scales. Three times he went to the town hall to plead for their return, and three times he was turned away. At 11:30 a.m. He came back for the last time. خذيه معناها واحدة بتاع ليسونس وهز الشريعة البقية اللي بقالوا معناها بالسلعة هزها وحطها أمام مقر الولاية وجيب ال ال ليسونس صب على رطلة على الشريعة وصب على روحه كيش بيت لبريكية. The crowd drawn by Muhammad's protest included his cousin Ali, who arrived too late to stop the final act in the tragedy. قام بالتوجه إلى وصل الطريق هنا وسكب على نه على نفسه البنزين. بنزين. وكان موجود هنا وأحرق نفسه. النفس. He had come to petition the government here to ask for some help, but they didn't let him in. And he then went into the middle of the road, put benzene on himself and set himself alight. دمش كون نحل بلوزون تاعه. He was saying that uh, I mean there were few people around, and there was one man with a with a jacket um, who tried to uh, put the flames out on uh, on Muhammad, but it was uh, too late. It's too late. This is the scene filmed by Ali on his mobile phone moments after Muhammad set himself on fire. Even in these extreme circumstances, manifestations of public discontent in Tunisia were rare, and Ali understood instantly the power of the images he had filmed. Sidi Bouzid might be geographically isolated, but the internet had wired its residents to the world. At 6.47 p.m., Ali posted the video on his Facebook page. ندركوا تماما نحن اللي يلزم الاعلام يلزم نكسبوا الحرب الاعلاميه لانه احتجاجنا اذا كان ما يخرج من تونس راه ما يسمع به حد حد مثلا انا دخلت شخصيا في قناه الجزيره فردوا رد معناها في في الحكومه قالوا راهم هذوما مجموعه من المارقين As night fell Mohamed Bouazizi's story and the images of the rioting that had followed passed into the data flow of social networking sites and from there onto international satellite channels. On the 17th of December, however, there was no reason to think this would be anything more than just another largely anonymous chapter in Tunisia's recent history. After 23 years in power, President Ben Ali had become a master of state repression, adept at controlling the message and crushing dissent. This might not have been the dream of the generation who had won independence from France in 1956, but it was their legacy. In more than half a century since the French departed, only two men have ruled Tunisia, and neither contested an open election for the job. The country's first president, Habib Bourguiba, a flamboyant provincial lawyer who had fought the French for decades for the right of Tunisians to choose their own leader, had, once he was that leader, become less tied to the concept of democracy. Il y a il y a deux Bourguiba. Il y a un Bourguiba réformateur, euh, moderniste, qui a fait le choix volontaire et volontariste de bâtir un État moderne sur fondé sur la sécularité, sur la séparation de des institutions d'État de la religion. Le problème des droits de la femme, du rôle de la femme, l'égalité entre hommes et femmes. Le code du statut pour c'est un qui est important. Et il y a eu en même temps le Bourguiba autoritaire, qui ne tolérait aucune critique, qui, qui avait une appétit de pouvoir extraordinaire, 
qui a estimé que, après tout, la Tunisie, c'est une poussière d'individus. By 1975, after 19 years in power, the second Bourguiba was firmly in control, making himself president for life, formalizing what had long been the reality. La fin du règne de Bourguiba a été un naufrage, le naufrage de l'homme. Il y a eu la montée de l'islamisme euh, avec le phénomène de l'Algérie, qui était inquiétant, un islamisme dans la violence. Et Bourguiba, se fondant sur ses convictions sécularistes, laïques, etc., a euh, refusé d'accepter toute négociation avec quelque islamiste que ce soit. En faisant l'amalgame, tout islamiste est un terroriste. Et ça a débouché sur les confrontations euh, de, des années 80. In 1984, Tunisia erupted into violence. Bread riots started in the southern town of Gasrin and spread across the country, leaving 50 dead. Bourguiba recognized he needed men he could trust around him, strong men. A then little-known former head of military security, Zin al Abedin Ben Ali, was made director and then minister of national security. Why? Bourguiba was old, almost senile. We needed at that time someone in the Ministry of Interior very strong. I mean, there is a problem of order. Bourguiba, he needs someone in, in, in this position so he can stay a little bit longer. Two years later, Ben Ali was made Interior Minister. Even for those who knew him, his rapid promotion came as a surprise. Ben Ali is his classmate. He's from the same regiment than me. Ben Ali did not talk much. He would spend an evening with you here, I mean, everybody. He would not say more than three words. He would smile, nice, but he wouldn't talk. He was always listening because of his job, maybe. <laughs> Bourguiba was not alone in underestimating the quiet man. In October 1987, he made Ben Ali prime minister. A month later, the quiet man spoke. He gathered uh, 11 doctors and asked them to sign the papers telling that uh, Bourguiba is no longer uh, in good health to run the country. And by constitution, at that time the prime minister would become the president, he became president. After 30 years of one-party rule, the public euphoria was unconfined. Ben Ali's first public act on the 7th of November was to pledge to dismantle Bourguiba state. À partir de ce jour, plus d'injustice. À partir de ce jour, plus de présidence à vie. À partir de ce jour, plus de confiscation par un parti de l'ensemble des institutions de l'État et de quadrillage de la, de la vie politique. J'ai fait partie des gens qui ont pris ce discours au sérieux. Le uh, 8 of novembre, il est to à l'office du Prime Minister et une jeune fille a dit « Yahya Ben Ali, life forever ». Et il est went to à elle et a dit « Don't say Yahya Ben Ali, say Yahya Tunis ». Tunes forever, and it's extraordinary, really. It's, uh, it's unbelievable today. Bourguiba was to live another 12 years, able to die in the country of his birth, still remembered fondly by many, a privilege afforded to few deposed autocrats. For the Tunisian people, the honeymoon with their new president was to be brief. The signs were not too difficult to spot. Bourguiba's new constitution party was rebranded as the Constitutional Democratic Rally, known by its French acronym, RCD. The political freedom Ben Ali promised was also short-lived. Those imprisoned under Bourguiba soon found themselves again facing jail. Notre engagement a été trahi parce que très vite, on a vu, s'est imposé la réalité de la naissance d'une nouvelle dictature avec, je crois, une évolution de l'entourage de Ben Ali qui a fait que les pratiques mafieuses se sont installées. Et personnellement, euh, ça a duré entre 1993 et 1995 et je l'ai payé par une nouvelle détention.
The post of President for Life had been officially abolished, but Ben Ali ensured that the principle continued, changing the constitution to allow him to stand again and again and again. A generation of Tunisians were to grow up under Ben Ali's paternal gaze. In the newspapers, on television, in the radio, it was always about what Ben Ali did today, what Ben Ali is going to do, uh, who did he meet, so uh, the Tunisian citizen uh, was like living in a perfect world with its God, which is Ben Ali and his family. And, uh, and no one had the right to say that anything is going wrong. The youth now are fed up of everything. We lost everything. We, some people have no you know, view of the future. They didn't project themselves in the future in Tunisia, so they only think about going abroad. Strong government, no opposition, a limited or non-existent press. A situation familiar across much of the region. For dictatorships to survive, they have to be seen as benevolent. For Tunisians, this benevolence consisted mainly of a high level of education, Bourguiba's legacy and one of the strongest economies in Africa. For the new generation, however, this was no longer enough. Both education and the economy had shown themselves to be hollow promises. Our parents wanted to believe in the system and they wanted to build uh, a country where uh, everybody can live properly and raise their children and send them to school, etc. And they did it. We were. Uh, good at school, we, we, we are good workers, we, were, we are organized, civilized, and we're living under mafia. We were living under mafia and there is no hope. Ben Ali's mafia was to be his undoing, but in reality, he had little choice. Without popular support, he needed to buy loyalty from somewhere. Despite being a former military man, he had always seen the army as a threat relying instead on those around him to keep him in power. The elite of his two million strong RCD party and increasingly the family of his universally loathed second wife, Leila Trabelsi. These people needed to be rewarded for their loyalty and the natural result in a country not blessed with mineral wealth was corruption. كنا نحلم بأن نكتب عن الفساد ولكن أين ستنشر هذه المواضيع؟ كانت كلها مرتبطة بقطاع واحد هو قطاع العائلة المالكة كل موضوع له علاقة بالعائلة المالكة أو غيره لا يمكن نشره لأنه في نهاية المطاف لو تمكن من النشر فإنك ربما تتسبب في أغلاق الصحيفة في معاقبتها Control of the media had long been Ben Ali's key priority. International satellite channels that reported unfavorably on the regime were banned. But the arrival of the internet created what was to be an insurmountable problem. Il y a eu Al Jazeera, c'est vrai qu'il y a eu un... Et toute une campagne a été menée, orchestrée par le gouvernement contre Al Jazeera, en disant que Al Jazeera, elle invente des faits ça. Et alors, pour la blogosphère, ils n'ont eu aucune prise. Les sites étaient interdits, etc. Mais il y a eu un effet euh, au mouvement d'information, à cet environnement, euh, extraordinaire. Et, et là, ça a été la panique, la panique au niveau, au niveau du pouvoir. Parce que notre système d'information s'était verrouillé. Ces censurés websites sont devenus les vrais fameux websites en Tunisie. Un blogueur qui, avec un blog qui n'était pas censuré, isn't really a blogger, you see. Uh, and we called ourselves uh, the gangsters bloggers and the affluent bloggers because, because uh, the state knew us and uh, blocked us and people and uh, boys in internet. When uh, they see Ben Ali blocking someone, they knew that this someone is a guy who's telling the truth. Era 404. The message indicating a blocked site became a badge of honor for any blogger and a signpost to those interested in seeking the truth in Tunisia. In trying to control the messenger, Ben Ali lost control of the message. On ne pouvait pas en parler euh, ni, dans la, ni dans la presse, ni dans la télévision, etc. Les gens partout, dans les ateliers, dans les usines, dans les lycées, dans les cafés, 
n'avait que des informations des rumeurs sur le, le développement euh, à un rythme accéléré de l'enrichissement illicite et des pratiques mafieuses au plus haut niveau du pouvoir. For Tunisians officially facing 14% unemployment but unofficially twice that, these revelations were explosive. On the 7th of November 2010, the anniversary of Ben Ali's coup, the Tunisian rapper Hamada Ben Amour, aka El General, delivered an open message to the president, intended as a plea to rein in the mounting corruption of his regime. Into this already tense atmosphere came WikiLeaks, publishing a confidential report by the former U.S. ambassador Robert Godek, describing the overt kleptocracy of the Ben Ali regime. WikiLeaks had its importance in the sense that it, it showed to the world what we were living uh, in the everyday life. But, but for us, we didn't need WikiLeaks to, to know what's happening. The great majority of people uh, believed that uh, Ben Ali and that system had, uh, had been uh, just students of America. And these leaks demonstrate that first, USA doesn't care about that country. And for us, it was uh, good news. The US government's apparent indifference to Ben Ali's fate may have been only a small issue, but it added to an increasingly powerful tide of events against which the regime was now swimming. Cette conjugaison des trois facteurs, de la contestation sociale, de la contestation politique et de la contestation des pratiques de corruption et des pratiques mafieuses, a connu un, 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 un retentissement d'autant plus grand que le phénomène de la blogosphère et, 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 et de la communication, des nouvelles technologies de la communication, ont fait que ça a circulé de façon extraordinaire. Tunisia was primed for revolution in December 2010 when Mohamed Bouazizi's act ignited it. Mohamed Bouazizi étant devenu à juste titre un symbole de cette exaspération et de cette colère euh, existant dans la population, nous le savions, on ne pouvait pas prévoir que ça allait prendre euh, cette, cette euh, dimension. One man's sacrifice may have begun the revolt against the regime, but it was the events that followed in nearby Gasrin, the town that had started Ben Ali's rise to power 27 years before, that would make revolution inevitable. ذلك المشهد الرهيب المشهد لا يكاد يغيب عن عن عيني للحظة. كانت الناس كلها تأسفت للمشهد هذا وخاصة مشهد ما مشهد حرب هي بالفعل حرب وبالفعل مجزرة صارت في ولاية القصرين. With the benefit of hindsight, most revolutions seem predictable. But even Tunisians are struggling to comprehend how President Ben Ali's 23-year dictatorship could have disintegrated in less than a month. On the 17th of December, in the southern town of Sidi Bouzid, Mohamed Bouazizi, a 26-year-old fruit seller, was stopped by a local official. Claiming he was operating illegally, she demanded a bribe. كي هو حاب يحمي الميزان نتاعو ما خليتوش وضربات بزوز كفوف كي هو كي ضرباتو بزوز كفوف محمد جاتو كالشوك 
محمد جيته شوك قوية صدمة قوية برشا لوين عينيه دمعت وزراق ضرباته بكفوف معناها مراء أمام الخاص والعام في كيس رئيسي No official at the town hall responded to his pleas for the return of his scales and at 11.30 a.m. in a final act of despair he set himself on fire. Ali Bouazizi arrived too late to save his cousin but filmed the protest which followed on his mobile phone. We are completely clear that we need to stop the international war because the war that came out from Tunis is not going to be able to do it. At 6.47 p.m., Ali posted the video on his Facebook page. In a country facing economic hardship, mass unemployment and an overtly corrupt regime, Muhammad's story was symbolic of everything that was wrong, and his fearless but tragic act reflected the despair of a nation. Few realized it then, but the revolution had begun. The revolution might have begun, but there were few visible signs in the capital, Tunis. After 23 years in power, President Ben Ali had become a master of state repression. His feared interior ministry, the headquarters of a police state of more than 200,000 agents, dominated both the capital's central boulevard and the lives of Tunisia's citizens. Conversations were monitored, websites blocked, phones tapped. يعني نظام يراقبك لمجرد أنك تفكر بشكل مختلف. لم نصل بعد إلى 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 الالتزام وإلى العمل. بمجرد الاختيار بشكل مختلف. طبعا أنا 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 ك أنا كمحامي يعني كمحامي كان في عديد من الملفات وكان عندي العديد من الحرفاء والعديد من الأشخاص اللي قمت بالطرف عليهم قمت ب. مواكبتهم قانونيا و تعرضوا لتعذيب مع لا يتصوره العقل، يعني تعرضوا للحرق، تعرضوا للتعليق، تعرضوا للضرب بكل الانواع، تعرضوا للتعذيب بالكهرباء. Despite the fear, beneath the surface an information war was raging, one no longer limited to activists and journalists. In neighborhoods across the capital, the revolution was spreading. What had once been social networking had become political. It's more the users of Facebook than Facebook itself, because if it wasn't Facebook, maybe we should have used something else. We started uh, being a news uh, service, each one in his house, the week before the, the, uh, the, start, uh, the demonstration started in June, uh, by sharing the videos of what's happening in other cities, were far from us, and the t television uh, obviously didn't say anything about the, the, the events. People might be sharing videos, but for most in the north, there remained a gulf between thought and action, and demonstrations in the capital remained small. The great part of Facebook is didn't go to the demonstration. Every day, every time, in TV, with press, people can't stop telling me that it is the revolution of Facebook, of, of Internet. That's not true. Internet, Facebook, Twitter, they were, they were logistic support. They were not the revolution. Because the most important thing is that I, as a person, I click, I say, I click, and I go to demonstration. Although demonstrations in Tunis remain small, the rebellion in the south was gathering momentum. In Gasrin, a town of 100,000, which shared many of the problems of Sidi Bouzid and had been the scene of the 1984 bread riots, protesters came out in support of their neighbors. هذه الوقفة التضامنية والاحتجاجية كان لها تأثير على الشارع التونسي وعلى شباب ولاية القصرين حيث نعتبر أنفسنا أن ساهمنا في تكسير ذلك الخوف وذلك القهر الذي يشعر به الشباب 
من منذ ذلك اليوم بدات هناك تحركات على مستوى قاعدي من الشباب ومن من التلامذه ومن الطلبه والى غير ذلك. Dès le 24 décembre, il y a eu les premiers tirs à balles réelles à Menzel Bouzayen, à quelques kilomètres de Sidi Bouzid, avec euh, cinq blessés graves, dont un est mort quelques jours plus tard, et un manifestant, euh, un citoyen, un jeune, la quarantaine, tué sur le champ. The use of live ammunition in the south provoked the first mass demonstration in the capital. And on the 27th of December, a thousand people took to the streets of Tunis. كنا يسقط بن علي، كنا يسقط الترابلسية اللي هم عائلة بن علي، كنا القضاء هو قضاء ترابلسية يعني الشعارات التي رفعت كانت موجه رأس للرئيس وهي أول مرة تك. With protests on his doorstep, Ben Ali decided it was time for his personal touch. Mohamed Bouazizi might have been unable to gain access to the lowest official in Sidi Bouzid. But by the 28th of December, he had the full attention of the President of the Republic. As a publicity stunt, it was poorly staged. The supposedly concerned President appearing in his street clothes without a mask or gown in a sterile burns unit next to a man many believed already dead. <laughs> Ben Ali's speech to the nation, made a few hours later, was to be no less misjudged. Ben Ali understood neither his country nor his people. En disant, nous sommes les garants de l'ordre. C'est une opération, c'est un processus d'anarchie qui a été instrumentalisé par des agents de l'étranger, par des gens, des agents de la subversion intérieure que nous connaissons et qui a été orchestré par les, 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 notamment par la chaîne satellitaire Al Jazeera. It was like uh, someone who, who, who were insulting us, who were treating us like dogs. At this moment, I, I, told, I told my friends, it's uh, him or me in this country. On the 4th of January, Mohamed Bouazizi's death, long suspected, was announced. The family was told to be discreet, but thousands attended the funeral the next day. Once again, the images spread, fanning out across the web in defiance of the state. A 20th century system of repression could not keep up with 21st century media. Everything is going very fast and uh, all their repression system is slow. They tried to arrest people and then they thought about I don't know why. But it goes too much slowly comparing to how we get the information and share the information and share the idea and share uh, the programs of the protest. And every false information was straight, you know, uh, attacked or denied with a video saying this and this and this. It would be easy to dismiss this as a phony war compared to what was happening in the South, but the regime was taking it seriously. The physical containment of the South meant nothing if every Tunisian became aware of what was happening there. On the 6th of January, the secret police rounded up several of the figures publicly supporting the demonstrations, including bloggers like Aziz. Questions, 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 questions. Some tweets, some horrible tweets. They accused me of defacing uh, pirating uh, governmental websites. When I went out uh, the midst of Ontario, I was going direct to five years of, of prison. Ben Ali recognized that people were losing their fear of his regime and knew he needed to remind them of how he had remained in power for 23 years. The place he chose for his lesson in terror was Gasrin, the town that had first brought him to prominence as the head of national security. Uh, حيث قام أعوان البوليس التونسي بمحاصرة مداخل الحي من داخل الحي من الجانبين 
لكن الشباب اخذ في رمي الحجاره ورمي المقذوفات على ذلك البوليس لطرده من الحي لكن عند الساعه التاسعه مساء فوجئنا بسماع اطلاق للرصاص الحي والنار كان اطلاق مواجه للقتل فقط خطر الاصابه الاولى اللي شهدناها وشهدتها انا شخصيا كرئيس قسم الانعاش هنا في القصرين الجثث الاولى والقتلى والشهداء بالاحرى اللي اللي وصلونا الجثث بتاعها كانت تطلقات في مستوى الراس في مستوى العنق في مستوى الصدر وفي مستوى البطن لكن اللي تفاجئنا انه الرصاص او الخراطيش المستعمله هي خرطوشه تدخل الى جسم المصاب نجد على جسمه فقط اقل من 0.5 سم منطقه الدخول نتاعها وتنفجر في وسط المكان اللي تدخل فيه الصدر او البطن او حتى الدماغ تنفجر وتحدث اضرار رهيبه جدا وهذا لم ما تعودناش عليه ام الفرق القنص هذه الفرق الخاصه اللي قام البوليس التونسي بسحب الى ولايه القصرين قامت انتشرت فوق المنازل والمباني العاليه ومناطق الامن التي تكون بنايتها عاليه هي ان ارى شباب ولايه القصرين مقنوص بالرصاص ومرق على الارض ذلك المشهد الرهيب مشهد رؤوف البيزيدي لا يكاد يغيب عن عن عيني للحظه خاصه اني اعرفه جيدا كما قلت لك كان مناوب عندي لذلك المشهد عندما رايته مرد قتيل ما لقيناش ادويه كافيه ما لقيناش قاعة للعملية معناها نبقوا نتفرجوا على المريض وكانت كانت الناس كلها تأسفت للمشهد هذا وخاصة مشهد مشهد حرب هي بالفعل حرب وبالفعل مجزرة صارت في ولاية القصرين. In Tunis people listened in horror to calls from friends in the south. أول ما بدأت أحداث القصرين والرقاب احنا تجمعنا في نقابة الصحفيين فكان تأتينا مكالمات هاتفية من أشخاص مباشرة يسمعوننا صوت الرصاص الحي وكانوا يصرخون كان هناك رجال يبكون بالدموع ويصرخون ويقولون لنا إنها مذبحة أنجلونا ونحن صحفيون أثناءها لم يكن لدينا أي خيار لم نتمكن من الذهاب إلى الجسرين لأنه تم إغلاق كل الطرق للذهاب إلى الجسرين أو سيدي بوزيد كان يمنع على الصحفي أن يتنقل إلى تلك الاماكن في تلك الاحداث وحتى ان انتقلنا اين يمكن نشر تلك المعلومات There was however no need for journalists to process these images or newspapers to publish them As with Sidi Bouzid people in Gasrin posted the films they had taken with their mobile phones on Facebook In minutes they had spread across the world اعتقد ان هي مش ثوره فيسبوك هي اعتقد هي ثوره القصرين ولكن للحقيقه لولا الفيسبوك لقبرت القسرين على بكرة بها ولقتل جميع من فيه بدون أن يسمع أحد وهذا ما تعودنا عليه في السابق الفيسبوك فتح الأبواب لما يعرف ما يحدث في القسرين وأحدث إرباك لابن علي وأتباعه On Monday the 10th of January more than 20 men, women and children lay dead or dying After القسرين There was no going back. Everyone appeared to be aware of this, except the president. That evening, he again addressed the nation. In what was to become a familiar refrain for leaders across the region, he admitted that mistakes had been made, but not by him. There would be change at the top, but it would not be him. But in saying, "Look, I have decided to take some measures, and notably." le limogeage du ministre de l'Intérieur et euh, euh, de faire en sorte que les responsables de la situation ainsi créée euh, rendent des comptes. Like all dictators, Ben Ali could not comprehend that it was not about jobs, YouTube, Facebook, his interior minister or even his rapacious family. It was about him. The show of force in Gasrine had backfired. Instead of being a lesson in terror, It had only served to show Tunisians the extraordinary bravery of their countrymen. At this particular moment, I knew I will go in the street every day till I don't know what would happen. Maybe, maybe we, we, we all got, got shot or maybe we finish in prisons, but I knew that something has changed in my life. The day after the bloody events in Gasrin, protests broke out across the country. By the following day, Wednesday the 12th of January, hundreds, 
had become thousands. Ben Ali deployed his army, but unsure of their loyalty, looked to his trusted police force to save his regime. I went to the hospital to help the doctors there and I saw people dying. I saw a guy shot straight in his heart while he was going back from his work home and I saw the faces of people, I saw faces of nurses and doctors. You no, know, we're like, what would we do if the people who are supposed to protect us are shooting people in the street? At this moment, I thought maybe the country will change, maybe people will say no, definitely. So. 28 deaths and more than 100 injured were recorded in Tunis's central hospital alone. Many more were killed far from the main centers of protest. As with Gasrin, this was an act of state terror designed to scare people off the streets and back into their homes. To convince them that they had to choose between Ben Ali and anarchy. أغلب الشهداء كانوا إما في التظاهرات أو كانوا يشاهدون التظاهرات تمر من أمام البيوت أو بالطريق العام أمام المحلات وهناك بعض الشهداء كانوا على أسطح البنايات كانوا على أسطح منازلهم داخل أحياء شعبية لم تكن فيها أي أحداث أو اضطرابات وفجأة يصاب شخص برصاصة من قناص. But no one was calling for Ben Ali's help. Martial law was declared, and Ben Ali is reported to have given the army the order to shoot to kill, an order refused by both the commander and his men. That was the moment of uh, separation between Ben Ali and the army. The army just said no. Uh, the army isn't ready to, to, uh, to provocate war, because if army shot at police officers, or police officers shot at army, it would be a war, a war that uh, one step. Without the backing of the army, even Ben Ali appeared to understand that he needed to make personal concessions. And in his speech to the nation that night, he pledged not to stand for re-election in 2014. He also abandoned classical Arabic in favor of the Tunisian dialect. He reminded the nation as if it needed reminding of his long service as president, his military career. He had been betrayed and let down by those close to him. He regretted the loss of life. There would be no more live ammunition. Voilà la charrette de Limoges. Plus de cartouches à partir d'aujourd'hui. Et je vous ai compris. Mais c'était trop tard, heureusement. It was surreal. People are dying in the street. We hear. Uh, gunshot and he's saying there is no more uh, we're not shooting at people anymore I'm not responsible and everybody's happy of my of me being in the government a nighttime curfew was declared and the streets emptied an uneasy silence descended on Tunis broken by sporadic gunfire rumors circulated that secret police had taken to the streets in hired cars pretending to be a spontaneous demonstration in support of the president they drove around the city, terrorizing the neighborhoods that had dared to oppose Ben Ali. He brought all his propaganda equip in the, uh, in the street with rent cars and saying, long life to Ben Ali, we love Ben Ali, and they're uh, shouting and uh, loud. And uh, uh, at the same moment, there were shots in the street. 
<laughs> At the same moment, I had his testimony on the phone I was writing on Facebook saying there is people dying and I really was afraid and all of us were afraid uh, the 13 in the night that everything's going to come back like it used to be. And I think this is what made people go in the street on the 14th. A population which had lived for more than half a century under two successive autocrats had lost all sense of fear. وكان في مسيرات خرجت مسيرات من كل صوب واحد وشارع كبير شارع البرجيبة هذا كان شارع ممنوع على المظاهرة إلا أنه يوم 14 جانف كان في تصميم كبير أنه يقع اختراق هذا التحريم ويقع دخول إلى شارع وهذا كله تم تم كان في أكثر من سبعين ألف ولا ثمانين ألف متظاهر واتجهوا رأسا صوب وزارة داخلية اللي هي علامة القمع وهي الأداة اللي كان الرئيس المخلوع يحكم بها توسيع هي هي آلة التروية يعني آلة التخويف اللي كانت ترعب كل الناس يعني أقبية الداخلية والتعذيب إلى آخر التواجد أمام الداخلية واعتصام رهيب يعني موجود في الصور يعني أمام وزارة الداخلية هو اللي أنهى حالة النظام Political prisoners who had been released found a very different city on their return to the capital. I was shocked. I was really shocked. Uh, at, a at a certain time, I began to laugh and cry and dance and, and doing uh, jam things and singing with persons and kissing other persons. And I felt at that, at that, at that moment, I felt that I, I, I had won. At 5 p.m., the curfew again emptied the streets. The country had never seen anything like the events of Friday the 14th of January. But after 23 years, few could imagine a Tunisia without Ben Ali. At 7 p.m., a different face appeared at the presidential lectern. Ben Ali's Prime Minister, Mohamed Ghanoushi, announced the president's departure. For many young Tunisians, this was the country's true independence day. Try to take your heart from here. Try to do something like that so bl the blood can't pass. After 15 minutes, do that. Let the blood pass and feel. That's, that was that was the feeling at, at this moment. It's more than the, the, the liberation feeling. It's, uh, I think, everybody have, have to experiment that thing at least once in, in his life. For those old enough to remember independence from France, it was no less emotional. And who say their fierté to have seen our people, our jeunesse, les mains nues, affronter uh, la dictature et mettre à terre le dictateur. Uh, je vous assure qu'il y a des moments où je, je me dis que je vis un rêve éveillé et que à mon âge et compte tenu de mes problèmes de santé, je ne pensais pas que vivre, connaître de mon vivant cette situation. Tunisians did not know it at the time, but their revolution was about to inspire protest across the Arab world. How much has really changed, however, remains to be seen. The symbols of the regime may have been destroyed and the contents of the houses and businesses of the corrupt elites looted and burned, but half a century of one-party rule will be far harder to erase. When the Soviet Union and its system of government disintegrated under the weight of people power a generation ago, Western politicians celebrated the seemingly inevitable victory of their democracy. The reality has been far more nuanced and there is no reason to believe the future of the Arab world will be any more predictable. The future for Tunisia itself remains uncertain. Substantial political and economic problems persist. 
But for the first time in the country's modern history, this is a future which rests not in the hands of one man, but of an entire nation.